today I'm going to talk about distributed learning dynamics, a convergence in routing games, uh, which are an essential part of uh, transportation and mobility, uh, and hopefully will tie in with many themes that we've heard at KDD, or not only in this workshop, but in others. Uh, so if you think about a historical perspective on uh, monitoring and routing, in the field of transportation, um, these very classical set of infrastructure you see here have been the way historically a lot of the DOTs have gathered data over the last decades. Uh, and the paradigm being basically the government holds it all, gathers everything, maintains the infrastructure, um, and so on. If you look at the historical perspective on mobile devices, going back to the 70s, what's amazing at the very beginning of last decade is this curve here, which is nearly vertical, which is the rise of the number of Android devices uh, produced um, uh, in the world. So when the project I'm going to talk about began, uh, it was really pre iPhone 1 launch. Um, this is where we are today, and that's the respective um, penetrations of the platforms. And so the first part of the talk uh, I'd like to give is really explaining the story how we got from here to the explosion of mobile data for traffic and urban computing. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll give a notion of some of the algorithms and what can be done with the information that was generated by this data. So the rough outline of the talk is, first I'll talk about the Mobile Millennium Project, which was an early instantiation of this participatory sensing paradigm. Um, and that'll bring me to the second part of the talk, which is really, you know, now that this is done and that, you know, there's many companies and many sources of information that have kind of integrated a paradigm, what, what can be done with it and what does it mean for future mobility? So back historically, in 2008 when we started working on this, um, the very first um, um, traffic app that was ever deployed in North America, uh, gathering GPS information um, gathered from a uh, cell phone that uh, was prior to the iPhone 1, so uh, or iPhone 2 actually, so there was no GPS on iPhone, and Android didn't even exist. So we um, wrote one of these very first apps that ran on the Nokia phones at the time. They were still the big players in the, in the field. Um, and that's how we started populating traffic maps with uh, information. So, um, and that's quite interesting because if you think about this technology, it had nothing to do with transportation. And within two years, it enabled the leapfrog from this, which is kind of a vintage website that, uh, you, you know, if you wanted information back in 2008, you would go to 511.org. And if you were in a good and techy state like California, that's what you get. In another state, you might not even have gotten anything. And within a couple of years, basically, this is where we got. Everybody's got this on their phone today, regardless of the country you live in. And that's mostly because it's gathered from, um, from smartphones. So I'll tell you the story of how we build it first, and then I'd like to move into what that means for today's information. When we started working on that project back in 2008, um, the DOTs did not even believe uh, for some of them that this could be done. And so one of the things we had to kind of proof of concept was um, show that with a given penetration rate of phones, uh, you would have enough information to gather um, valuable traffic info. Um, that number we thought would be 2 to 3%. That's back in 2008. Uh, we believed at the time that with 2 to 3% of the population gathering the information and giving it to you, you could reconstruct traffic information. If you think at the market today and who is in that business, if you take Google and Apple aside, any other company that is not producing their own data, whether it's Enrix, TomTom, Tom, Here, or any other company of that sort, that's roughly the penetration they have. So our job was, at the time, to figure out whether that would be enough. And to do that, what we did is we hired um, 200 students, asked them to drive cars around 10 miles of freeway back and forth, each of them carrying a phone. I mean, remember, this is 2008. And sending data to a real-time uh, center that you know, was trying to um, show it in real time. We placed a bunch of teams on uh, bridges to, to film everything with cameras. So we'd have a completely different source of data uh, with every possible vehicle. Um, that would be later on for purposes of validation. Um, and then while we were doing this, we basically held a press conference where we had a screen. And on that screen, which you see here, the, basically all the TV and the media was there, we were presenting real-time traffic information broadcast live from uh, phones. These are the phones that were on the freeways at the time. Um, so about 100 guys turning back and forth. And this is probably the first time in history that, that there was live information broadcasted by cell phone and, for, and from cell phones only um, to the um, to the uh, uh, to, to the press, um, something quite funny happened in the middle of the experiment. Um, there was this huge uh, traffic jam here. We detected uh, the police was with us, and there were a lot of people with us. So that person used to work at Traffic.com, and on that phone, she's calling Traffic.com, company you probably 
uh, heard of that they were acquired since, because uh, nobody believed there was uh, that much traffic when they could see the freeway nearly a mile away and, and didn't believe it. It turns out there was a five-car pileup accident, and we ended up catching it faster than the police, because at the time, the police used to have pagers, and you remember a pager, right? It sends you a text when there's something, um, and that, that caught it almost instantaneously. So that was a very good, uh, um, well, um, uh, sign for us that that was promising technology. And so then what we ended up doing over the years is built a traffic monitoring system that, that um, uh, can encompass all this data. So blending a lot of data sources, not just GPS, but loop detector data, Bluetooth data, license plate reader data, radar data, all kind of data we could get our hands on, building filters for it that would fed into models um, that would be used for estimation and forecast and ultimately generate traffic information um, themselves. Um, this is roughly half of the percent of the data we were getting at the time. This one we can show because we got it actually from taxis, so it's public. Um, and that would show you for San Francisco if you had about 500 vehicles uh, gathering GPS information every minute or 30 seconds, what the data would look like throughout the day. And just for references, you take a company like Uber today, they probably have at a given time 2,000 vehicles operating. So if you add this to all the other connected devices, this is completely minuscule to the amount of data we're getting today. But the point was that at the time, it was enough to produce valuable tra traffic information, not only on freeways, but also on arterials. Um, and you know that gives you a sense of the skills you're talking about. Just in one day, you can pretty much crowdsource the entire map of the city. And even from these, you can crowdsource a good part of the uh, map of part of the Bay Area, including you can see the International Terminal of the uh, um, uh, San Francisco Airport. So you can imagine this is almost uh, six or seven years ago now. Um, today, the, the amounts are even more um, exorbitant. So if you were looking at a given freeway, and you were able to gather 2% of traffic. And remember, unless you work for Google and Apple, you, th there's very few places which have 2% of traffic. Uh, Inrix here, um, Navtech, um, TomTom, they have this because they buy it from third party. But other than that, it's very hard to get that data. Um, and of course, if you are Google or Apple, you probably have way more uh, than that. That's because every Android and every Google app produces GPS data that is fed back to their system. But if you had 2% of data, that's roughly what you would see. Um, so this is the time of the day, and this is the location on the freeway. And you can see for the specific uh, launch event we had, um, the traffic um, jams forming and then dissolving and so on. Um, and by the way, that data is on our website. You, you can use it for research purposes. It's all in the public domain. Um, and so the work we did was essentially saying, well, let's take that data and let's try to see if we could find algorithms that can reconstruct the same traffic information based on way less data than this, which, you know, like say you, you decimate 90% of the data, could you still do something with it and, and reconstruct the patterns, which is kind of what we did. And that was really what the companies were interested in when they were all starting because the game at the time was unless you were Google or, um, or Apple later on, um, you did not have as much data. So we did that. Um, we um, kind of ran it against uh, Google um, at the time because uh, we wanted to see how we can benchmark ourselves uh, against them. I mean, very quickly, the amount of data they gathered uh, grew enormously. Uh, so typically, we would look at um, traffic information they provide. We would compare it to traffic information we provide. And ultimately, of course, um, uh, their feed got much, much better. Um, and that corresponded to a time scale at which, uh, basically, this research, which was a lot of work in terms of traffic estimation, in terms of inference, uh, progressively migrated to um, the, the, the private sector. So this, fund, this funding initially came from Nokia and Navtech, um, and then progressively we started working with other companies. Ultimately, a lot of them hired our own students to create their own products. And today, everybody has a phone, everybody has a traffic map, everybody has that information because we're all collecting it. So in a sense, one can say that if you look at the evolution of um, phones and, and, and phone ownership, um, so just in the US, I mean, we're already uh, at the 200 million phones. And in some places, I mean, like I have two phones, a lot of people have multiple devices and their car is connected. So already, um, the amount of data there is enormous. So I think it's fair to say that this field is very mature. That information is available, is available to everybody, OK? Uh, most of the time, it's free. I mean, unless you want advanced products, um, usually traffic information, you don't have to pay for it. So what is the next question? Th there was, there's, there's one next question for the public 
um, sector and for a lot of the players in the ecosystem. And then there's a broader question, which is the rest of the talk. Well, the first question is like, how do we get access to this data? Because the, the truth is, unless you work at Google, unless you work at Apple, uh, who have enormous penetrations of phones in, in the Western world, um, nobody's really seen that data, and it's very hard to get access to that data. So the very first question that we had to answer is, you know, public agencies are interested in buying that data, but they don't really have a process for it. So when we finished that project, what we started to do is try to define acquisition procedure for procurement for the state. And in fact, the first procurement of GPS data that was historically done by the state of California um, was done by us for the state because there were new procedures to uh, invent for that. And you know, the procedures have to take data quality into account. So if you're buying GPS data for planning, okay, you can buy them in bulk every year and you're probably good. If you're buying them for ops, so you want to feed a real-time traffic management system with it, you need guarantees. You need guarantees on latency, so any data that is older than 300 seconds, so say five minutes, is probably not that helpful for traffic management because traffic changes at a scale of roughly one to five minutes. Um, and then if someone tells you, you know, I'm gonna sell you two million data points a day, for this area, but all of the data comes at night and there's nothing during the day because they're a tracking company, well, that's also not very helpful for traffic management. And so part of the tools we have to build for them, and that goes into the urban analytics, is you know, defining the right metrics so that that data would provide value to the state. And so if you kind of wrap up all the work that went on in this field over the last years, there is a lot of modeling contributions uh, because modeling the way the um, finding new models that then integrate that, that, that data, that was kind of a novel thing. Um, estimation, which is really the process of how you take that data and you provide an estimate of something, speed, the flows, the travel time, and so on. Um, experimental contributions, because you just had to build it, and then eventually data quality contributions. That's for estimation, okay? So estimation is in a sense the hidden engine that runs on all of your phones or in the back end that fires your phones that transform this in this. Um, and so now comes the natural question of how that data could be used for traffic management. If you think about this is probably the most used tool in traffic management. That's a time-space diagram. It's a simple concept. You have time, you have post-mile, and basically the caller indicates the speed or the flows or whatever you're pl plotting. So in an ideal world of traffic management, this should be all blue. Okay, you, that means no traffic jam. That's, that's in a sense the goal of every traffic manager. And so if you think that of the dual problem of estimation, which is control, in a sense, what you would like to be able to do is to create arbitrary patterns, which are as good as possible for your operational needs on these diagrams. So this is one of the things we started to do with, um, well, this is UC Berkeley, we've got to uh, you know, be patriotic here. Uh, we, we could write a beat Stanford or something else like that. But um, essentially, uh, the, the next generation work that, that came after estimation was trying to control freeways and controlling freeways is, is essentially trying to create any arbitrary patterns um, to, to maximize your operational needs. So you have constraints, you have metering lights, you can let people on the freeways, you can potentially use other tools like dynamic speed limits. Um, and so the ability to maximize a cost function that corresponds to an operational need of the state is really going to the, the game in California for the next 10 or 15 years. And to do that, what people typically do is they build um, decision support systems, at the core of which you have an estimation engine. So in a sense, all the first part of the talk I just finished, that's the yellow box here. That's the engine that takes in data and that spits out an estimate or a forecast. And then if you think about what's happening today in the decision um, centers, uh, for example, District 4 here for Northern California or District 7 in Los Angeles, um, you have a whole process like this, which is currently run by humans and which are, we are in the process of automating in which a forecast will eventually lead to predictions that humans can use to make their decisions and that lead to operational um, commands on, on how to control the system. That process today is mainly manual in the US and that process does not take much of the data I just discussed um, either as demand data or as real traffic information data. So not only in California, but in most of the states in the US and in many countries in the world, um, people are now building something like this uh, that can integrate not only uh, the traffic lights, the metering lights, but also other modes of transportation and ultimately demand management tools like incentivization to tell people that maybe today they shouldn't drive, they should take the bus or um, other modes of transportation. So, in the US, the way this jurisdiction is divided is people today mostly do it corridor by corridor. 
So this is the I-210 corridor, and the corridor is roughly, I don't know, 20 to 40 kilometers of freeway with a few major arterials next to the freeway, and usually with a, a, a rail line and a lot of transit systems to feed the rail line. Um, so in the case of the 210 corridor, which is our main um, um, corridor of, of demonstration for this technology, um, what you see here is the freeway, that's the 210 freeway. Each of the red points is a point that we control that will be a traffic light that we can um, remotely actuate. And then the name of the game is to maximize uh, throughput here or to minimize total travel time or any combination thereof that is of agreement to the um, district in charge. And obviously, that's um, an extremely complicated uh, uh, control problem, uh, which requires a lot of modeling and requires um, a lot of simulations. Ultimately, the goal of this is, um, and it's going to take probably a decade before it can be built, um, the ability of integrating all the tools that are at the disposal of the traffic engineers in the corridor, which are not just traffic lights or local area traffic um, signals, but also an app that people use or a plug-in on Waze or any other thing that is massively used by the people, uh, changeable message signs, dynamic parking, ramp metering, and so on and so forth. So, okay, that's a big project. There's a lot of DOTs working on it. That's, these are things we're helping them. What I'd like to focus now on is one of the problems that occurs in building the systems. Because obviously the systems are they're multi-million dollar projects, so they're fairly ambitious. So I'd like to focus on one narrower problem specific to the problem of routing people through the transportation network. So the problem is a relatively simple problem that we all face, which is how you route people on the freeway. And what I'd like to try to understand is how all these beautiful tools everybody built, uh, which give you allegedly the shortest path from A to B, how do they influence mobility patterns? Because nobody really knows how that works in practice. You hear a lot of things about how this company improves congestion because they route you optimally, and the truth is, might be very different from what we hear in the news. So a, a typical formalization of the problem that is used by planners is people have origins and destinations. And throughout the day, you usually sleep at home and work. Sometimes you sleep at work and work at home, but that's a bit screwed up. Um, so, um, so typically in the morning when you, when you go to work, you have to choose between different options that are given to you. So you can think of this in terms of routing as distribution of a flow. So P would be routing the flow um, of a certain population K at time T. Okay? And that's a decision you make every day. Every day you're going to decide whether you go this route or that route. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to experience a travel time, L, of t, okay? And that travel time tells you, well, you took 101 this morning to go to Cupertino, took 25 minutes, or took uh, 55 minutes, and then based on that, you probably make your decision the next day. Or the app you're using makes that decision for you the next day because they're gathering statistical information. So in game theoretical terms, what that means is that um, if, if, if all of us are using a router or, or an application, whatever it is, Waze, Google, Apple, Inrex, you, you name it, um, then basically we're all part of a given population. And if you take that part, say the part that lives in San Francisco and that goes to the South uh, Bay every day, then every day what happens is whatever, you, whatever app we use routes us based on our origin, our destination. And at the end of the day, the app figures out how long we took. And of course, with machine learning algorithms and statistical learning um, and some flow theory, what these apps do is they learn and the next day, they'll give you a routing that depends on what they observe. If they observe that every Monday morning, um, one-on-one is congested because, I don't know, the airport empties a lot of cars on the freeway, then on Monday mornings, over time, they learn to not route you through 101, and they'll route you through 280. And that's what happens. So from a game theoretical standpoint, what that means is that there's the environment that does stuff. That's where things happen. There's a ball game. There's a, there's a repair. There's construction. And there's an outcome that results from that. That outcome is used by apps to route you, and these apps try to route you optimally. So now the question is, does that process even converge to anything? So this you business that every day takes what happened the previous day and how much it was good or bad, that process is dependent on every company. Google will have a specific learning algorithm, and Apple will have another one, and third company will have a third one. and so. Now, we don't really know what these are, because obviously this is every company's secret sauce. But we have a sense of what they're doing, right? Because all of them are trying to do what's best for you, which is the shortest path. So we'd like to understand that process. 
does it converge to something optimal? And, 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 and it, it's a true open question because it really depends on what people do. Um, so um, that's just what I described here, okay? And so if you think about the way these companies work, so you type an, you, you type an, an origin, you type a destination, usually they give you one route, and sometimes they give you a few other options that are nearly equivalent. So what is the thing they're trying to optimize? They're trying to optimize your travel time. Because if they don't give you something which is optimal for you, then you're going to switch to the competitors. I mean, you know, who would want to use a routing app that is good for society but makes you 10 minutes longer than um, you would do if you used another app? So, I mean, the main criteria today is not social optimum. It's your own good, your own selfish good for, good for you personally. Um, so now they all do it differently because they all have their own algorithms. So what that framework models is basically a system in which you know, a percentage of people will use Waze, or we use Google, which is roughly the same nowadays after they merged. Um, another, one will, another proportion will use Apple, Inrigs, and so on. And then each of these apps will each route people according to routes which are the shortest according to their prediction engines. And so that means the users of Waze, 30% will go this way, 8 this way, and 62 will go this way. And then the users of Google, 40% will go this way, 7% this way, 57% that way. Should add to 100%, so that's wrong. Um, so, okay, and all of them learn day after day how to do it better. Okay, so th the first question is, is that, well, is that optimal for society? No, obviously, and we'll show why in a minute. But then we don't even know if that process converges, right? Imagine one company sends everybody on 101 on Monday, and then it was really bad. So on Tuesday, they send everyone to 280, and then it's really bad. So now they're on Wednesday, back to 101. I mean, the, you can see how these things could oscillate. And so the type of work we do is modeling these processes and understanding under what condition it converges. And then, well, if it converges, is that even optimal? Is that good? Is that worse than could be done otherwise? So there are a lot of questions that are asking this is first, can we guarantee that you converge to an equilibrium? And then what can you say about the convergence? Is it robust? Um, and then potentially, could you say even how fast it converges to this equilibrium in case it converges? So over the next 10 minutes, I'd like to describe the mathematical models uh, that do that. Um, so in mathematical terms, what that means is, if you remember that iterative process I showed here, um, I was just saying that at the next day, these companies have learned from the previous days and try to do it better. So the question is, can we find some classes of learning algorithms such that this process is guaranteed to converge to a set of equilibria, which is denoted by chi star? And uh, equilibria, as we know, in, in traffic are rarely unique. So it's going to be a set. There's no single equilibrium. So first, we'd like to know, is there convergence? And second, if it converges, does it converge to something known? What is it? It will be, in many cases, a Nash equilibrium. And then the next question is like, well, if it converges to a Nash equilibrium, is it optimal? And the, the answer, in general, will be no. So the mathematical definition of a Nash equilibrium is an equilibrium from which you don't have an incentive to deviate. So if, you, if everybody is being routed in a specific manner, and if it's a Nash equilibrium, if you take another route, it'll be worse for you. That's a nice and simple and naive way of explaining a Nash equilibrium, which is essentially saying that the reward uh, cross-dotted with a deviation from the equilibrium can only result in something bad for you. Um, and that can be related to optimality conditions in, in optimization. And so now the name of the game is, um, we're going to prove that this process of all the companies learning from the previous day and doing something better for you the next day converge to Nash equilibrium. Um, but it's going to be an interesting convergence proof because unless you make specific assumptions, uh, this convergence can be actually pretty bad. So if you think about the least um, amount of assumptions you can make on uh, the policies, um, the, 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 the first one that comes to mind is the no regret assumption. And the no regret assumption is basically um, you compare yourself to the best thing you could have done if you had played over time. And if you do better than that, you have no regret. That's essentially the definition of no regret analysis. So if you route yourself with no regret, what you can, which is really a generic uh, and the most uh, um, uh, general thing we can think of, um, then you, you don't even have convergence. And so what does that mean? 
That means that if you take a simple example like this, where you have two origin and two origin destination pairs, red and blue, um, and two populations that are trying to route themselves in there, um, if you don't make assumptions beyond the fact that there is no regret, then you can end up with uh, things like this. So what's going to happen is, you know, population one has uh, the, the so I'm going back here. Population one has three possible routes, right? One. Two and three, okay, and so you're going to allocate these, um, and then same with population two, and then you're going to allocate flows every day, and then you're going to look at the previous day, and you're going to try to optimize this based on what you learned, and what you're going to end up happening is that basically things will oscillate, and what that means is that in essence, if if the learning algorithms of um, if the learning algorithms of uh, these companies that route you use the paradigm like this, which is the most general paradigm then you could really end up in a situation where on Monday, all the users of this app will go to 101, and on Tuesday, they'll go to 280, and on Wednesday, they'll go back to 101, and they'll create these oscillations. Um, from a machine learning perspective, it's actually still a good thing, because if you take the average over time, it does converge. So for people who do stochastic gradient descent, actually, they know this, because that's, uh, well, that's a way to do uh, gradient descent, and it converges on average but it doesn't converge in real time. And so for traffic, it's actually really bad. So the conclusion of that first assumption is that, you know, if people just try to maximize um, your personal payoff and, and have no generic assumption, then you, you don't even have a guarantee of convergence. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, so the second um, uh, approach is to use a stochastic approximation and to essentially model this decision process as the hedge algorithm. And the hedge algorithm is an algorithm that is a very classical algorithm in which what you do at the next day is replicating what you did at the previous day multiply by a penalty proportional to what you encountered with a weighting factor. So it's saying if you had a really bad day, so long travel time, that number is big, it's going to be weighted, and the exponential, because it has a negative, will be very small. So you're going to allocate very less, very little flow to that the next day. But it's all weighted by your parameter. So that's called the hedge algorithm. And if you make the proper assumption on this eta t factor while discretizing the equation this way, what you can prove is that under specific assumptions, in particular uh, on the uh, stochastic perturbation noise you add to it and on the uh, weighting, then you have um, convergence almost surely to a Nash equilibrium. So what does that mean? That means that now, if every company was using a learning algorithm, and remember, we don't know what the companies are doing unless you work at the company and you're actually designing the algorithm. But if the companies are using an algorithm like this, like, like the Hedge algorithm to do the learning, then what we know now is that the system will almost surely converge to a set of Nash equilibria. OK, so that's interesting, because what that means now, and this is most likely the case, is that you know, if the system is not evolving too fast and the learning is slow, then um, essentially, in uh, asymptotic value, um, as demand evolves, the repartition of the flow will be such that everybody gets more or less the same travel time. OK, so it's a Nash equilibrium. It's not social optimum, and we'll see why later. But that's a good news, though, because that's a good news that it converges, because now th we, we know there can't be oscillations. We know that ultimately they'll die because of the convergence. Um, the way to prove it is you essentially use uh, what's called the replicator dynamics, which is a um, continuous dynamical system that can be used as a modeling tool. And if you discretize it, you show that that repeated decision process I showed earlier uh, can be um, um, uh, modeled by it. And so this is the continuous versus the discrete system and uh, illustration of the convergence um, uh, to, a local, to a global um, optimum. So just to finish on that mathematical part, and then I'll go back to applications, you can make the assumptions even stronger. And you could say that, well, actually, you'd like to use an even stronger model to model it. You'd like to use the Rosenthal potential, which is a convex function to model a decision process. It turns out that Nash equilibria um, in routing games are the solution to the minimization of a convex function, so f here, which is the Rosenthal potential. And um, so uh, minimizing the convex function 
in a decentralized manner, which is the same as saying that you know you have all these companies optimizing in independence, um, can be modeled by a gradient descent where you do actually the mirror descent up every step. And so that's how it's done. In essence, you're saying every day, um, you know, I'm going to pick um, one of my gradients, which is essentially the payoff at the end of the day. And the decision process for the learning for the next day is going to be doing one step of mirror descent, which is minimizing this uh, addition of the Bregman divergence uh, weighted by one over a weighting factor plus the dot of your previous um, outcome. Um, and if, if that's what you use to model um, the uh, decision process made by every company when they're optimizing it, then what you can show is you can show convergence of that process to the Nash equilibrium, which is um, the uh, solution to the Rosenthal potential. And the beauty of this is that that can be decentralized. So in a sense, the companies don't need to talk to each other, and they don't in practice. And you can even add a imperfect estimates, which is basically a stochastic way of adding it. The beauty of this is that if you make these assumptions, you have now not only guarantee of convergence to a Nash equilibrium, but you also have guarantees on the convergence rates which means you know how fast you're converging to close to the optimal solution, and you know how far you are from the optimal flow distribution. So here's the summary. The summary is we really don't know what all these companies are doing because nobody can see all of their algorithms. But we can make assumptions on what we think they're doing in terms of providing you a solution you want to use as a customer. And then based on this, we can actually model what the resulting outcome is of all of these companies competing for the same um, um, uh, commodity, which is uh, highway capacity. And we can assess how good it is or how bad it is for um, traffic. So for example, if I take back this little example I have shown before, um, if you make the assumptions now that you know, they're doing this uh, Bregman divergence uh, optimization, then you do have convergence. Okay? For example, here um, you have uh, three uh, different flow allocations. Um, and you can see that um, you, you have basically 0% of traffic going onto the green path. And then a certain percentage going here and a certain percentage going there. And if you look in practice, that makes sense because the travel time on there is much higher. And well, nobody goes there. So that's why you would never use an app that gives you a worse travel time. But the other ones converges to a value, which is the same. So, and then you can check the speed at which this convergence happens. And so now, um, of course, that's a very naive model of the way the learning is done by the companies. So the next thing we did is we actually asked humans to play that game, first to see if it would work in practice and how fast it would work in practice. And then we used it to analyze what we see from the data uh, with real traffic. So first, let me show the practical game. So the game is a game where we've launched on Mechanical Turk in which each of the users is given an interface like this. So thousands of people like you can play it if, if you want. Um, and so the way it works is you're being given, say, an origin and a destination. So it's like you're Google. OK, you, you can play being Google for a day if you like. Um, so um, you're Google, and you're in charge of, um, I don't know, um, San Francisco to Cupertino. And you can allocate the flows the way you want. OK, so obviously that's done by an algorithm. Um, if it was done optimally, it would be done by an algorithm. And now there are other players, and they also compete with you, and they compete for the roads. So everybody has different origins and destinations, different population, and everybody competes for the same road, and everybody can see what happens at the end of the day, and based on that, decide their next decision. And every 30 seconds, you make a new decision for the next day, and after, I don't know, a couple minutes, now you have um, basically simulated a couple of days, and we see what happens um, to you. And so what's amazing with that is that when we ask people to play this game online, very quickly, they converge to a Nash equilibrium. So in a sense, um, I don't know, probably if you play that game, first you're going to put equal amounts of flows on every link, because that's very intuitive. You try everything. It's going to Las Vegas. You know, you bet on, on everything, right? And then you see where you start to make the most money. And then based on that, you decide where to allocate your chips. So here is exactly what people do. And, it, and what's really nice is that um, uh, at the end of the day, we can show that they converge. So, and, and the information they use in that process is they just see the graph. They can allocate whatever percentage of their flow to whatever path. And then they see how well they did in the previous iterations um, cumulatively. And, and they can see also, how much, just to help them remember, how much flow they allocated to which path so that they can figure out their, their best strategy. 
And that process in which essentially, you know, if you're playing Google and the other guy is playing Apple and the third guy is playing Enrix, in a sense, nobody knows what the others are doing. They just see the outcome of the whole process on their allocation. And that's uh, exactly the assumptions that were made in the previous thing. What's also fun is that you can see different learning behavior. Some people are very aggressive. Some people are not aggressive. Some people are exploratory. Some are less exploratory. It turns out that the learning rate, eta, um, can be inferred from a convex program through that process, which is essentially learning how fast you learn. So the algorithm, if you play that game, the algorithm can learn how fast you learn and can start to forecast what you will play in the next phase. So typically what happens is this is a bunch of players here. And they're more or less all trying to converge. And some of them are super aggressive. And some of them are very exploratory. And at some point, they all start to figure out what's the best for them and converge, which you can see on the convergence rate of the cost function. And so then what we will try to do is, based on this, you can essentially try to forecast what they will do in the next run. And that's interesting, because that information right now is not really taken into account by routers, in the sense that if you have a company, they provide you routing, but they don't provide you routing based on what they think the other company will do. I mean, they basically, so far, only use statistical information from the past, but no forecast models of their competitors. So it's an interesting thing that you know, might change the way routing is done in the future. But OK, the truth is, um, is that really good for society? And what can be done about it? So again, if we do look at this process, which is essentially what happens today, where you know, companies don't share information, companies don't share the way they learn, and companies don't really do things in any other way than to make your commute as short as possible. Um, there are a lot of issues with that. So here's some press coverage from a given company. Um, and it's a very good job on the PR side, because basically, if you read these types of news, and many companies do that, what you will see is, they basically tell that having you have the shortest path is improving traffic. But we all know that's not true. I mean, I just explained why with the Nash equilibrium. But nevertheless, you read the headlines. And in essence, what these headlines say is that by using a given app um, uh, that make people find the fastest route, um, we're going to improve traffic. Okay? And it's not just on the West Coast. It's also on the East Coast for our friends from MIT. Um, and so. Um, then what happens is this. So local upset at Google or ways for sending traffic their streets. Why is that? That's because after a while, the system starts to divert people into different neighborhoods. If you've ever taken a uh, certain uh, mobility as a service um, company, uh, black or pink or any other color, um, you will know that their drivers um, always use a certain routing app in, if they don't use the native routing app. So in essence, then people get really upset because, um, like you like you can see here, uh, these, when they're massively adopted, start to significantly disrupt the um, local traffic patterns to the point that some people ask their grandmother or their grandfather, who are retired, to go and walk with a phone in the middle of the street really slowly to pretend there's a traffic jam. Right? And that's how you sabotage an app. After time, it will, it will figure out it's actually not a real data point, but for a while, it will work. And then when you go to um, specific uh, planning companies, what they tell you is that they can't fight these companies. These companies are enormous. They, Google, I think, has more than 1,000 legals. And you know, a city like Pasadena probably has four legals. Um, so what do they do? They build stop signs and street bumps, because that slows down traffic. And then the routers learn over time not to take these streets. So to protect yourself against traffic, you create a traffic jam to hope that people don't come to your city. This is happening in hundreds of cities today. Uh, OK, why? Because people believe that with a paradigm by which we give you the best route, we do something best for society. But it's not. It's in direct contradiction of the very notion of a Nash equilibrium, for which Nash got the Nobel Prize many decades ago. To give you a simple example, for example, for Pasadena, if overnight, 15% um, um, of um, the population started to use a given app. I, I pick ways, but it could be any app, really. Um, well, what would happen is the following. Um, this is the percentage of users using an app, and this is basically the travel time. So initially, traffic is pretty bad on the freeway, and traffic is pretty good, travel time, in the city. 
And then the more people start to use it, the more basically is, is decongest the freeway. It's pretty good for the freeway. And it, of course, starts to congest one first arterial and then the second arterial until the travel time is equal. That's a Nash equilibrium. Then you don't have an incentive to move anymore. You could see how this is really bad for the city and how this is probably OK for the freeway. And that raises the more fundamental question of, well, if people are going to do that, then should there be an arbitration? Should the state pay money to the city because there's more pollution in the city? The state owns the freeway. The city owns the city street. Or should the company, which doing, is responsible for it, pay for it? So these are a lot of new questions that we'll see more and more in the future. Um, but the point, there's two points here. First, um, uh, displacement of congestion um, has multiple causes. And second, Nash equilibria, which is this, is not optimum. You, there would be more optimal flow allocation, but that would require coordination between all these companies, which is really not happening today for good reasons. And so just to finish, um, I think that one of the things we're really interested in working on in the near future is specifically to show how on these flow allocation problems, you know, collaborative strategies could allow these companies to split their flow evenly in a way that doesn't damage the level of service to their users, but is more optimal for society. And obviously, you know, it, it's going to be a long, long, long way before cooperation is possible between different entities. Um, it's probably ultimately unavoidable. And if you look at places like Singapore, in a sense, congestion pricing is probably the ultimate way to control that. Because if you start to charge for road usage, and there is also a committee working on this, um, in uh, California, then in a sense, now the cost function is not only time, but it's dollars. And then you can start to reestablish the balance. And so this is the type of work that uh, ultimately uh, we will be doing. So I think I'm nearly out of time. So I'm going to stop here um, and skip the last thing. So this is my last slide. So in conclusion, um, from a historical perspective, you could see the last decade being the decade of traffic information. Over the last 10 years, We've created tools, all of us, like the whole community, has created tools that give everybody access to the best transit time, the best taxi time, the best everything. And in the specific case of traffic management, in a sense, that led to the realization of a Nash equilibrium. Um, 10 years ago, most of the freeways were really, really congested. And that means we were not, we were not even as good as a Nash equilibrium. We're even worse. Like it was bad to go on the freeway and nobody wanted to go to the arterial streets because they didn't know them or they thought there were dangerous people there or whatever. Okay. In the last 10 years, that information became available. So as we saw from the news article, more and more people started to go towards the secondary streets, which means we're not exactly at a Nash equilibrium, but we're nearing a Nash equilibrium. So you could, you could view this evolution over the last 10 years. The evolution of the next 10 years is, okay, how do we take that paradigm and now make it evolve to the next equilibrium, which is really a socially optimum equilibrium. And that's really what the public policies should do. The public policies, with the help of congestion pricing, should help all of us collectively to steer this Nash equilibrium, or this Nash-like equilibrium of what we have today, into something more optimal. And um, I think 2.20, there'll be time for me to stop. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.